This is Young and Dyslexic, You've Got It Going On by Benjamin Zephaniah. Um, this is in preparation for your L English Language Paper 1 exam. It could come up for question 4 and 5 if the exam board chooses for it to, uh, to come up. It might not, but you must be prepared. So looking at the title, straight away we've got Young and Dyslexic. It's almost like he's asking you um, while you're reading this, are you young and dyslexic? And that um, suggests that his intended audience are those who are young and um, who are dyslexic. And then it goes on to say, you've got it going on. Um, so it's quite informal, so he wants to be relatable and, and maybe speak kind of on the level of young people. Um, but it's also reassuring and encouraging and that um, we can see that again throughout the passage as well, especially towards the end, how encouraging he is and positive about being dyslexic. As a child, I suffered, but learned to turn dyslexia to my advantage, to see the world more creatively. So we know it's going to be anecdotal because we've got as a child. So Zephaniah is sharing a personal experience. He's also using emotive language, child and suffered. So he does want to appeal um, to the reader's feelings and evoke some, um, some sort of sympathy, really. But the next clause follows with a positive tone, the fact that he learned to turn dyslexia to his advantage. So this foreshadows that he's not just going to talk about the negatives um, of being dyslexic, but he's going to mostly focus on actually the positives. Uh, and it just creates this kind of defiant tone, uh, which we will see throughout the passage. We are the architects, we are the designers. So the parallel sentence structure here focuses on these two roles, architects and designers, typically very creative, very skilled roles, um, highly respected. So he is emphasizing that you know, being dyslexic could be a great advantage for you. Look at the kind of great possibilities that you have. Notice also that he uses the collective pronoun, we. So he's encouraging this sense of unity. And um, I'm sure he's, he's trying to comfort those who have dyslexia um, to say, you know, you're not on your own. I'm of the generation where teachers didn't know what dyslexia was. The big problem with the education system then was that there was no compassion, no understanding and no humanity. So Zephaniah is using triplets here. Notice that they're all negative. No, no, no. In other words, the education system was extremely limited um, and just left no room for any real care or attachment um, to to the students. I don't look back and feel angry with the teachers. The ones who wanted to have an individual approach weren't allowed to. The idea of being kind and thoughtful and listening to problems just wasn't done. The past is a different kind of country. So we've got negative language here, weren't and wasn't, and that just continues this idea that the education system back in the 70s in Birmingham um, was very limiting. And also it just creates this sense of frustration as well, which we will see as he shares um, some more anecdotes about him being at school. But um, there's a little bit of a twist there when he says the past is a different kind of country, which suggests that this was in the past and this isn't the case now. So again, there is an element of hope in this paragraph. Um, and so there is an element of kind of, of positivity for those who are young and dyslexic now. At school, my ideas always contradicted the teachers. I remember one teacher saying that human beings sleep for one third of their life. And I put my hand up and said, if there's a God, isn't that a design fault? If you've built something, you want efficiency. If I was God, I would have designed sleep so we could stay awake. Then good people could do one third more good in the world. So this is an anecdote. Again, he's using dialogue to kind of give us an insight to, into the type of student and young person that he was. Um, he's really trying to highlight how creatively he used to think, um, which again links to this idea that he argues if you're dyslexic, um, that helps you um, be more creative. Unfortunately, the teacher um, offers 
quite a contrast to that. So the teacher said, shut up, stupid boy. Bad people would do one third more bad. So the use of dialogue here, which includes insults towards Zephaniah, um, obviously doesn't paint the teacher in a good light. It helps exemplify the harshness of the education system that he has previously talked about. Um, but most importantly, it highlights this contrast of how negative the system was. This teacher focuses on how bad people could do more bad, whereas Zephaniah focused on the fact that good people could do more good. So I think this just helps emphasise how negative the education system was. I thought I'd put in a good idea. I was just being creative. She also had a point, but the thing was, she called me stupid for even thinking about it. I remember a teacher talking about Africa and the local savages, and I would say, who are you to talk about savages? She would say, how dare you challenge me, and that would get me into trouble. So again, another anecdote, just to give another example um, of the limits of the education system. In this case, we're, we're noticing an example of racism and how different cultures are stereotyped. You know, bearing in mind Benjamin Zephaniah is, is a minority. Um, so we're also seeing he's not just stereotyped for his cognitive ability, but he's also stereotyped for his race. Um, so he had um, kind of very little chance, really, which he'll talk about in a moment, in education. He, he had everything kind of going against him. Once, when I was finding it difficult to engage with writing, I had poems in my head even then. So that's, I think that's just really sad to think about the system that he was in and um, how discouraging it was for him. And he already had poems, so he had so much potential at the age of 10 or 11. He's a great ability, he's done so much now, but all of that was in him from an early age. And he just didn't have um, the space to um, practice that and, and to kind of explore those talents, which is a real shame. And when I was 10 or 11, my, my sister wrote some of them down for me. When I was 13, I could read very basically, but it would be such hard work that I would give up. I thought that so long as you could read how much the banknote was worth, you knew enough or you could ask a mate. Um, so just this idea that he would give up, it's quite sad to think of a young child giving up so young and having so much potential. I got thrown out of, out of a lot of schools, the last one at 13. I was expelled partly because of arguing with teachers on an intellectual level and partly for being a rude boy and fighting. I think the reader will appreciate how honest Zephaniah is there. He doesn't just say, I was expelled because they didn't like the fact that I challenged them. He does openly admit that actually he was a rude boy and he used to fight as well. Um, so I think that gives him credibility. It makes him much more trustworthy and, and much more likeable as well. I didn't stab anybody, but I did take revenge on a teacher once. I stole his car and drove it into his front garden. I remember him telling us the Nazis weren't that bad. Uh, so interesting organisation here. Look at how he structured, structured this. He starts with, I didn't stab anybody, which obviously would be a terrible crime, but then goes on to say, I stole his car, which is pretty bad to steal a teacher's car. But because he started with this idea of, well, I didn't stab anyone. Now the reader doesn't think he's as bad. And then he very quickly moves on to tell us a horrible detail about this teacher who clear, clearly was extremely racist to argue that the Nazis weren't that bad. So again, it just helps us um, like Zephaniah a bit more and maybe make excuses for his, or not excuses, but justify his actions and, and understand it within the context of, of the world that he lived in. He could say that in the classroom. When I was in Borstal, I used to do this thing of looking at people I didn't want to be like. I saw a guy who spent all his time sitting stooped over and I thought, I don't want to be like that. So I learned to sit with a straight back. Being observant helped me make the right choices. 
A high percentage of the prison population are dyslexic and a high percentage of the architect population. So he's using statistics here and he's also showing a contrast. There's a great contrast within the population of those with dyslexia. You're either going to prison or you're going to be an architect and obviously it's not it's not quite like that but that's what he's trying to paint this great possibility of being um, dyslexic and how differently your life can lead depending uh, I guess on the choices that you make. If you look at the statistics I should be in prison notice the modal verb there so it suggests that just everything was really leaning towards him ending up in prison and let's have a look as to why he says that. He says he's a black man brought up on the wrong side of town whose family fell apart, in trouble with the police when I was a kid, unable to read and write, with no qualifications and on top of that dyslexic. So he's using extensive listing here to relay all the things about him and in his life that really went against him and should have held him back. So for me, I just have great respect for Zephaniah, knowing all these things, knowing all these obstacles, and then finding out later, which we will in this passage, just how successful he's been. And that, that's really inspiring. It's inspiring for me, and I'm sure it'd be inspiring for those reading this who are young and dyslexic. But I think staying out of prison is about conquering your fears and finding your path in life. When I go into prisons to talk to people, I see men and women who, in intelligence and other qualities, are the same as me. But opportunities open for me, and they missed theirs, didn't notice them, or didn't take them. I like how he's worded this, because he hasn't said that they don't have the opportunities, and Zephaniah really tries to maintain this sense of positivity and hope. So he doesn't say that they don't have opportunities, but he's just said that they missed them, they didn't notice them or they didn't take them. But he doesn't say that those opportunities aren't there. So again, he maintains that, um, that positive, encouraging tone. I never thought I was stupid. I didn't have that struggle. If I have someone in front of me who doesn't have a problem reading and writing telling me that black people are savages, I just think, I'm not stupid. You're the one who's stupid. I just had self-belief. So he uses a simple sentence here. He does, uh, does also at the beginning of this paragraph, I never thought I was stupid. I didn't have that struggle. And that just creates this real confident tone um, and a real kind of defiant tone as well, um, which suggests to the reader that, you know, to succeed, you have to have that self-belief. You have to have that confidence. For my first book, I told my poems to my girlfriend who wrote them down for me. It really took off, especially within the black community. So he's using colloquialisms. We've seen that in the title as well. You've really got it going on um, to hopefully relate to the to the reader. And that's what's made him lovable as well. Because if you um, look at the next line, he says, I wrote with love for with love. And that's what actually people liked. And it made people feel like they could relate to his poems. Um, so he's kind of learnt how to um, communicate effectively with others. People didn't think they were dyslexic poems, they just thought I wrote phonetically. At 21 I went to an adult education class in London to learn to read and write. The teacher told me, you are dyslexic. And I was like, do I need an operation? So he's, um, <laughs> I love that line, um, he's using humour, um, so he's creating a light-hearted tone, but also he's showing that he didn't know what that was, especially growing up in the 70s. There wasn't as much awareness then as there is now about dyslexia. So it's also highlighting his naivety to um, his like cognitive abilities. She explained to me what it meant and I suddenly thought, oh, I get it, I thought I was going crazy. I wrote more poetry, novels for teenagers, plays, other books and recorded music. So we have listing here, we've just, he's just found out that he's dyslexic and we go straight into the next paragraph with a list of all his achievements. He's written poetry, novels, plays, other books, recorded music. 
So again, we're just getting this idea that, you know what, you've just got to have this self-belief, you've got to find your path in life and look at all the things that you can achieve. I take poetry to people who do not read poetry. Still now, when I'm writing the word not, I have to stop and think, how do I write that? I have to draw something to let me know what the word is to come back to it later. So if you notice he's using temporal marker, still now, he is highlighting that even though he's done well, dyslexia hasn't left him. It's still something, it's still an obstacle that he has to deal with. So he still struggles to spell and he has to really think about it. So for example, the next line says, if I can't spell question, I just put a question mark and come back to it later. So he's sharing his, um, his techniques and strategies um, to cope with dyslexia. And that is exemplifying his creativity and how he kind of works around his, his difficulties. When I look at a book, the first thing I see is the size of it. And I know that's what it's like for a lot of young people who find reading tough. So again, he's trying to relate to his reader. When Brunel University offered me the job of Professor of Poetry and Creative Writing, I knew my students would be officially more educated than me. So look at the language choice here. First of all, we've got Brunel University, Professor. Um, so these are kind of, this is language of like academia. Again, which just highlights that dyslexia should not hold you back in the academic world. Um, I tell them you can do this course and get this the right grade because you have a good memory but if you don't have passion creativity individuality there's no point so he's suggesting there there is an issue with the education system that actually it really tests you on your ability to to memorize rather than um, your passion creativity and individuality and he's already argued that actually if you're dyslexic you have more creativity and, and that's more important. In my life now, so another temporal marker here, so he's again um, focusing on the fact that he still has dyslexia, he still has these obstacles. I find that people accommodate my dyslexia, so think about how he started this passage, as a child I suffered, and now we've got this contrast. In my life now, I find that people accommodate my dyslexia, so this introduces this real um, feel of hope. I can perform my poetry because it doesn't have to be word perfect, but I never read one of, sorry, but I never read one of my novels in public. When I go to literary festivals, I always get an actor to read it out for me. Otherwise, all my energy goes into reading the book and the mood is lost. So it's, it's shocking really to think that he's written so many amazing things and he is not able to read his own work if it's, if it's a novel. So it just highlights the, the difficulties that he um, experiences by being dyslexic. If someone can't understand dyslexia, it's their problem. So we've got this defiant tone again. In the same way, if someone oppresses me because of my race, I don't sit down and think, how can I become white? It's not my problem, it's theirs. And they are the ones who have to come to terms with it. I just love this whole paragraph. He's so defiant, he's funny as well, and his use of humour highlights how ridiculous stereotyping is. It's interesting that um, he groups the people stereotyping him or judging him for his dyslexia with judging him for being black as well. Um, so he's he's kind of highlighting that this was a, a shared, almost a, the, the lines between being black and being dyslexic were blurred. He was kind of stereotyped for both. If you're dyslexic and you feel there's something holding you back, just remember, it's not you. So we've got punctuation here, the use of the colon. Typically, this, help, this encourages you to give more attention to what follows. And that means that the important message here is it's not you. So again, trying to reiterate that there's nothing wrong with you. If you're dyslexic, there isn't something wrong with you. You just learn differently. And the issue is with those that judge you. And he's using direct address because he really wants to reach out to those who um, have dyslexia and may be experiencing similar things to, to what he did as a child. 
in many ways, being dyslexic is a natural way to be. So I think that's really encouraging to say, actually, you're not different. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, if anything, it's, it's a natural, natural state. What's unnatural is the way we read and write. If you look at a pictorial language like Chinese, you can see the word for a woman because the character looks like a woman. The word for a house looks like a house. It is a strange step to go from that to a squiggle that represents a sound. And it's a really important argument. It's such a, it's such a logical argument as well. He's absolutely right. It isn't actually a natural thing to do, to read and write. It's man-made and we didn't have this from, from the beginning of time. And he's, so he's again suggesting actually the weird thing is to read and write. I'm not the weird one. Reading and writing is the weird thing. Um, I just love this use of the word squiggle, which relays his experience. When he looks at a page, he doesn't see words, he sees squiggles. So that helps share that, feel, that experience um, of, of confusion when you first look at um, some writing. So don't be heavy on yourself. So we've just got, again, this encouraging, reassuring tone. And if you are a parent of someone with dyslexia, don't think of it as a defect. Dyslexia is not a measure of intelligence. You may have a genius on your hands. So we've got punctuation again, use of colon. The important bit there is that if you're dyslexic, you could very well be a genius. Having dyslexia can make you creative. If you want to construct a sentence, and can't find the word you are searching for, you have to think of a way to write around it. This requires being creative, and so your creativity muscle gets bigger. So notice how he's created a word here, or the creativity muscle. Why would he do that? Probably because he doesn't want to put off the reader. What's the point in using a fancy um, technical term for the part of brain that's functioning while you read? Um, is that going to relate or be as, as relatable to the reader? Um, this actually helps create an image in your mind of, oh yeah, when I'm, when I'm having to jump that obstacle to read that, that word, I'm working out my creativity muscle. Kids come up to me and say, I'm dyslexic too. And I say to them, use it to your advantage. See the world differently. Us dyslexic people, we've got it going on. We are the architects, we are the designers. So a number of things here, we've got collected pronouns, again, us dyslexic people, we've got it going on. We've got um, repetition of the um, title, as well as we are the architects, we are the designers. So he wants to, again, just emphasize the fact that you've got all these great possibilities if you're dyslexic, see it as an advantage. Um, I haven't noted it here, but also notice the fact that he says things like use it to your advantage, see the world differently. So he's using imperative verbs. So he's really kind of encouraging those that are reading this to see it as an advantage. It's like these kids are proud to be like me. And if that helps them, that is great. I didn't have that as a child. That's important because he's just mentioned that kids are proud to be dyslexic now and Having, including the fact that he didn't have that as a child, just remind you of some of the anecdotes he's shared and um, really emphasises how different things are, how, how much has changed in a re relatively short amount of time. And again, that's hopeful. I say to them, bloody non-dyslexics, who do they think they are? Um, so we've got this light-hearted tone at the end. He's obviously being um, a bit cheeky here, but that's to obviously build rapport with those who are dyslexic. Um, and again, to create this sense of unity. So here are some ideas. Please don't just rely on this. This is just an idea of what you should be doing before your exam. Start thinking now of Zephaniah's thoughts and feelings. If the exam board selects this one, you will need to um, consider for question four, what are his thoughts and feelings? So here's just um, a few ideas. He, he seems frustrated by the old education system. Um, He's convinced that dyslexia is not a measure of intelligence and he's 
definitely convinced that dyslexia is an advantage. And then underneath, I've just bullet pointed some of the techniques that are used um, to show that. Please remember, and I think I've forgotten to say this in any of the videos so far, that for this question, you must refer to both language and structure. So get a good variety in, not don't just focus on language.